Welcome, everyone, and thanks for listening in to today's episode of our Chat with the Chair podcast. Today, we're joined by Dr. Sean Quatra, the Joseph W. Burnett Endowed Professor and Chair of Dermatology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and Chief of Dermatology at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Dr. Quatra is an internationally recognized dermatologist, clinical leader, and physician scientist with special interest in skin of color research, treatment, and management of chronic inflammatory skin diseases. Thanks for being here today with us, Dr. Quatra. Thank you so much for having me today, Meredith. So I gave a high-level overview of your professional background, but tell us a bit more about who you are. Absolutely. So I actually grew up in North Carolina, and I stayed there for my undergraduate degree at Duke University. Um, Also stayed in North Carolina for medical school at Wake Forest and did my dermatology residency at Johns Hopkins. After residency, I joined the faculty and had been there for a while before accepting this position here at University of Maryland. And during my career, I've been focused on seeing patients with inflammatory skin diseases. And a lot of the questions we've had at the bedside has translated into research that uh, my laboratory has also performed. So I see patients clinically. We do clinical trials, actually multi-center global trials. I've had the opportunity to help lead and design those trials. And then also we do research in the spirit of discovery. So it's a lot of different buckets that we cover, but I'm very excited now to be at Maryland and help grow the program in all of those domains. What inspired you to pursue the field of dermatology? Dermatology is such an interesting field to me because whatever disease you have is visible to everyone. And so there's uh, an added degree of morbidity If you think about if you have a heart condition, well, you know you have that heart condition, but it may not be visible to others. If you have a disease like vitiligo, where your skin is becoming depigmented, then you have to deal with it, and you also have to deal with a perceived social stigma. And so that, to me, adds an extra burden of the disease and also an extra reward to help these patients overcome those diseases. Which uh, skin diseases would you say are most common, I guess, in the Baltimore area, and what are the challenges associated with with those, for those patients specifically? There's a lot of skin cancer in dermatology, so I think that there are certainly a lot of patients who have either family histories, personal uh, histories of skin cancer, so we need to see these patients to do skin screenings, uh, which is very important to us. There are also several diseases that disproportionately affect some of Baltimore citizens. Uh, So in particular, uh, I'm very interested in studying skin of color, and I'm actually the secretary treasurer of the Skin of Color Society. And in Baltimore, there's many diseases like hydradenitis superativa, where you actually get boils all over your body, so very difficult to treat. There's also several itch disorders, which I treat, such as a disease paragonodularis that disproportionately affects African-American patients. And then there's several other conditions like pigmentary disorders, keloids, where your skin becomes more scarred down and raised that disproportionately affect Baltimore citizens. How did you successfully transition from becoming a uh, physician, clinical physician, to now a physician leader? You recently joined University of Maryland School of Medicine and the Medical Center as the chair of dermatology. So tell us about your journey to becoming this now physician leader? It's a great question. I think it always happens in stages. So after graduating residency and starting as a clinical faculty, the first few years, important to just master the practice, be a good doctor to your patients. And that's what I focused on and continue to focus on. But after a few years, I was also able to grow my clinical program. So I founded an itch center uh, at Johns Hopkins. It's now moved to the University of Maryland. So I see patients and Through that, I've been able to be a leader of a clinical team, a research team, and so I think it just grew organically from there. The work that we'd done with time that I was able to increasingly have more leadership positions, and now with a lot of experience, being able to help some of our other faculty grow their practice and also their research. And so it's it's been very rewarding. I think it's mostly just a stepwise process. What made you choose the University of Maryland for your next career journey? I think the University of Maryland is very uniquely positioned right now for rapid growth and acceleration. The reason I I mention that is because we have so many hospital systems that are part of the University of Maryland medical system. 
from the Eastern Shore to the Cap region to um, Baltimore County. And it, it's really very expansive, the number of hospitals, the number of opportunities that are present at the University of Maryland. I think with Dean Gladwin's leadership and also very solidified leadership from FPI with Dr. Regine, Dr. Santa as well, Maryland is set to very much so grow. And what I imagine Maryland continuing to grow to become is similar to other flagship public universities like uh, UCSF, uh, Michigan. As the new chair of the Department of Dermatology, what do you envision for your faculty and for your practice? So the overall vision is that we're able to treat uh, the most number of patients who need dermatologic care in the state of Maryland. So we are set to grow and grow rapidly. And we are looking at new sites to expand to. And we're also very focused, along with growing our clinical presence, is also becoming more active in research. So clinical research, translational research we want to be involved in. We also want to give back to the West Baltimore community and we're focusing on specializing in treating patients who have dermatoses and diseases that disproportionately affect skin of color patients is very important to us. And then teaching is also very important. Uh, we have the University of Maryland medical students. We have a residency program that we have actually recently ex decided to expand as well. That's a very important focus for our department as well. So we want to grow in clinical care, research, uh, also education and giving back to the West Baltimore community. Those are our big pillars. Tell us more about the, the research that's currently underway in the field of dermatology, both at the University of Maryland, but also you know, externally. How, how do you see this field changing through research? Dermatology is undergoing a rapid change. There are many new therapeutics that are very targeted, so biologics or small molecule inhibitors. And so the field is laser focused right now on precision medicine and understanding exactly what is unique about each skin disease. So my laboratory, which has now moved to the University of Maryland, is focused on precision dermatology, just that. And so we actually take patients and draw blood and do skin biopsies. And we've been able to discover a lot of unique molecular signatures of skin diseases that also we've been able to translate into clinical trials. So very much so, we are growing that precision dermatology, precision medicine approach. We want the University of Maryland Department of Dermatology to in many ways be the center of universe. So patients that are referred here, and this is actually a story going on right now, we've had a patient referred who nobody knew what was going on, they just had redness all over their body. And our laboratory has been able to identify a unique molecular signature and new therapeutics. And so we want to be able to offer that additional benefit of precision medicine to our patients. So if we can't figure it out and no one in the surrounding community can figure it out, we're going to go the extra mile to, to help patients to be innovative and to help introduce new therapies. What is your patient care philosophy as a, as a clinician in addition to a physician leader? When you go in to see a patient for the first time or someone is coming to you as an a expert second opinion, a consult, and they've had a really difficult journey with their condition, what's your philosophy? How do you go into it treating them? I like to tell patients that I promise to always be honest and I'll tell you what I know and also what I don't know and that I will not stop trying. And so for me, particularly, I treat chronic itch patients, which is a very difficult specialty area. Actually, there's only probably a few people in the whole world that specialize in this area because there's so little known about why people itch. But for me, that's been very important that I'm able to be a champion for those patients because many of these patients get lost in the healthcare system. And the quality of life disruption of chronic itch is, you know, just as severe as chronic heart failure, hemodialysis, having a stroke. So many times these patients feel marginalized. And I always tell patients, I'll be honest what I know, and then what I don't know, I'll be honest too, and we can help decide together with shared decision making about a treatment process. So I'll share a story. Recently, I had a, a patient come to me who had very disabling itch of the scalp. And... They'd gone through 10 other doctors and came to see me, and I knew it would be a very challenging case. So we tried about 20 things. They all failed. And then I 
told the patient, hey, I've tried everything that I can think of. And these are all the things that have been noted in the literature to be helpful for you. But I do think there's something else we could try if you want to try it. There's certainly some risks. And actually, that interaction led to my lab and, and me and our team creating a new technique where we able actually did at the bedside injections with an anesthetic bupivacaine into the scalp, actually the occipital scalp, and we were able to improve this person's itch, and they subsequently got an occipital nerve ablation and improved. But it, to me, it highlights that there's an attitude that we will never stop trying or give up, and we'll be honest, we'll use shared decision-making. And I think that gives patients a lot of comfort to, to know that their, their doctors will not stop trying and that we really value our patients, I think that's the benefit of a flagship academic uh, medical center is that our mission is actually to treat patients, advance knowledge, also the research innovation and not stop. So that's what separates us from all the private practices or other groups that are around is that we will not stop trying uh, for our patients and using discovery also. Well, and the importance of multi-D care as well. You know, a patient whose life is incredibly disrupted by an itch condition like that I would assume that takes a toll on their mental health and as well as other systems within the body, right? It, it ends up becoming a, a multi-tiered problem because of this one condition, really. Absolutely. And, you know, some of my college friends actually sometimes laugh when I, I told them I treat itch patients and they laughed. They said, oh, why don't you do something more worthy with your life? And I said, this is very worthy. And, and actually, I was giving a lecture in Hawaii a few months ago about how to manage and treat itch. I was the co-chair of a conference and a dermatologist came up to me telling me that they had a patient that committed suicide because they weren't able to cure their itch. Yeah, it's terrible. So this is one of the most severe conditions. Absolutely, you need multidisciplinary care. So psychiatry, neurology, pain medicine, also another reason why it's great to be integrated with a tertiary care health system to be able to get all of the help that these patients need. How do you prevent faculty burnout amongst your team? I mean, burnout is such a hot topic. It has been since the pandemic. So what is your, your approach when it comes to that? How do you encourage and, and help to motivate your team when times are particularly challenging? Burnout is one of the most significant challenges we face in healthcare. I think especially after COVID, things really accelerated. And a lot of healthcare providers have had so much more stuff stacked on their plate, especially with Medicare cuts and more, you know, f financial pressures as well. So one thing we try to do is I ask everyone, what do you love doing? You know, wh what is something that you really enjoy? And then as much as we can, try to tailor that person's schedule towards doing more of what they enjoy. Because I think ultimately, if you do what you love, it's not work. And that's what I try to do with myself, too, is I, I, I really love a lot of the, the work that I do. I love my new position. And so I don't feel like I am working because I enjoy it so much. And that can help a lot. But I think when, if you really dread doing something, and this can be anything in life. I t tell this to my fellows also. If you really don't like doing something, it's probably not the best approach to, to like, you know, make you do it. We should probably just more better align and personalize how you spend your time so that you, you take that meaning out of it. So I think that's been the, the number one thing to help a lot. And then secondary to that, making other tweaks to help our faculty. So recently we've employed a scribe system that's taken some of the documentation burden in the EMR system uh, away from our providers. And I think that's helped a lot. And just listening, uh, my philosophy is, you know, at faculty meetings also just asking everyone, you know, what are the pain points, you know, having burnout be an agenda item, say what is causing you distress and, you know, actually addressing it very upfront before a problem emerges. And we know that it's so common in healthcare providers, we have to make sure that we're very proactive about addressing burnout. What's your best advice for those listening in who may be considering the field of dermatology? You better get started early, number one, because dermatology is arguably the most competitive specialty in all of medicine. Really? Yeah. I think part of it is it's a great work-life balance. 
And it's also very customizable. So if you want to be a expert in cosmetics, dermatology is a great way to go. If you want to be a pathologist, but look at the skin, dermatology is the way to go. If you want to do surgeries and cut out skin cancers, you can be a surgeon within dermatology. There's so many different avenues. All of medicine is actually encapsulated within dermatology. So it's very much so an attractive field. I would recommend people get involved early with uh, programs and networking. This is all very important. And being involved in something meaningful that's longitudinal, I always tell the medical students, it's not about how many papers you publish. It's about um, having a meaningful commitment to the specialty that people can appreciate and that helps push our specialty forward. I actually have had many fellows who've taken a year off to work with me, medical students who take a year off to work uh, with me, and they all usually match into really great dermatology programs, but they've taken that year to conduct great research, do outreach programs in the community, and really been able to demonstrate their commitment to the field. So I think just as early as possible, having a longitudinal uh, dedication to the field, showing up, those are all things that can help. And also trying to get uh, you know as good grades and scores as you can get because no one of it is competitive. So it is one of those specialties. Are there any networking opportunities coming up? How can those who are either interested in the field or those who are already practicing, how can they connect with you and uh, talk more about what it is you're doing here at the University of Maryland and what their goals and their mission and their vision is for maybe their own departments, their own teams? Absolutely. So we are, are growing and we have several opportunities. So we have grand rounds uh, that are happening every couple of weeks where we're, we take very difficult patients and we work together as a team to help to sort it out. And that, that's open to uh, many folks in the community. Uh, we also have several endowed lectureships where we invite speakers from outside. And we're going to have many more opportunities, I think, to get involved depending on if people are more interested in clinical exposure versus helping to participate in our research program. Right now, we're developing a clinical trials program here. Uh, so we're very excited about that. And then finally, we want to give back to the community, especially the West Baltimore community. And so we're exploring different ways to engage with the community, provide skin uh, care, access to teledermatology. We're exploring that in the upper Chesapeake and other underserved regions. So there's so many ways to get involved, to collaborate. We're also big on social media. There's so many different ways to interact and engage. What legacy do you hope to leave as chair of the department? That's a great question. I think that just going the extra mile to advocate for patients throughout the state of Maryland. That's our most important concern is regionally. Every patient in the state of Maryland, we want to make sure that we are providing access. And so the vision is, is that we take care of uh, the most dermatology patients of any group or provider or other practice in the state of Maryland, and we provide the highest level of care. So that's what we're trying to do the most. And then also just that spirit of discovery where we go the extra mile. We want to contribute, make lasting contributions to our specialty and how we treat patients. Those are the big things. Before we close out, is there anything else you'd like to discuss you think listeners should know? Any topics or last comments you may have? It's a very exciting time for dermatology and actually the whole DMV region. I am very excited about our department being positioned very well. Because within the system, there are so many different health systems that we want to grow dermatology. So I just encourage everyone listening to get involved. If you need to refer a patient, if you are a patient, if you want to participate in research or give back to the West Baltimore community, we are very, we are very focused on growing and, and helping all the patients in Maryland. Great. Thanks again for being with us today, Dr. Quatra. We're excited to see all the wonderful things that you and your team will bring to Baltimore and beyond. Thanks so much for having me on. Thanks again for stopping by for Chat with a Chair, brought to you by University of Maryland Faculty Physicians, Inc. For more information about today's guest or to listen to additional episodes, visit umfpi.org backslash podcast. Until next time.